2 is not that hard. In fact, this is all about the matter in chapter 2, which raises this question, why does matter matter? Well, <laughs> matter is anything that has weight or mass and then takes up space. And everything is made of matter. And since we're focusing on the human body in this class, the human body, like all living things, is made up of matter. So what does matter consist of and how does, exactly does it work? Well, matter is made up of elements. to it, all those different elements. But let's just take, for example, the lead in a pencil, which is made mostly of the element carbon. So that graphite in the pencil is made by this element carbon. Carbon, the element, if we looked at it really, really close, we would notice that that element is made up of a whole bunch of smaller things. Those are called atoms. So if I look at this one carbon atom, join those carbon atoms together in this configuration, I can get the graphite of this pencil from that element carbon. Well, the human body is made up of a significant amount of elements, some of which are more prominent than others. So I've got those listed here. So carbon is definitely one of the more common elements in the human body. Carbon is essential for all organic molecules. We call it organic molecules because they make and use carbon as an element. But carbon is important because of the way it can bend into rings and chains and uh, make these macromolecules that are essential to your body, like proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, things like that are carbon-based compounds. So carbon is important because that's the basis for organic molecules, which is what living things are, organic. Hydrogen is important because hydrogen can bond easily to all kinds of other atoms. Now, that might not make a whole lot of sense yet, but when we look at bonding a little later, we'll see why hydrogen can be so important for chemical bonding. Oxygen is important, and it's important for cellular respiration. So when your cells need energy, if oxygen is present, then those cells can make a lot of energy. We call that whole chemical process, cellular respiration, Oxygen is essential for that. You might remember what N stands for. Nitrogen. And nitrogen is important for building proteins as well as nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. Those are nitrogen-based compounds. P stands for phosphorus, which is also important for DNA as well as ATP, this energy molecule in the cell. So cells need lots of energy and ATP, the chemical bonds in that molecule are important for cells. K stands for potassium, so don't get confused with that. Potassium, and you need that for good muscle nerve function. So for your muscles and your nerves to be functioning correctly, we need lots of potassium. S stands for sulfur. Sulfur is important for building some proteins. So some proteins require sulfur for them to be functional. So sulfur is important for proteins, and a lot of your body is made up of proteins. Na stands for sodium. Sodium has a lot to do with fluid balance. So if you have a lot of sodium, let's say, in your bloodstream, then fluid moves into your bloodstream, raises your blood pressure, and we say, oh, be careful, you need to eat less sodium. So I get that sodium out of your diet. But sodium is important for that movement of fluid between the cells and the area around the cells. Calcium is important for strong bones. We think about drink a glass of milk and some calcium strong bones. But is it just about strong bones? No. Calcium is important for other things too, besides strong bones, blood clotting, muscle contraction, as well as some fluid balance. So calcium is a pretty important element in our human body. Magnesium is needed in the blood and chlorine is also important for fluid balance. We'll see more later. So these are some of the important elements in the human body. So if I were to take that element and just look at one atom, 
like one small particle of it. So like here, the smallest uh, particle of an element is an atom. If I were just to look at one of those atoms, what are some of the parts of that atom that I would see? Let's say we were looking at an element, and we just want the smallest particle of that element. Well, that smallest particle of an element is an atom. What are some of the main parts to an atom? Like what's an atom consist of? What's it made up of? So let's take a look at some of these subatomic parts, and let's see if we can identify them. Like here's a part that has no charge. That's called a neutron. Neutrons have no charge. Neutron, no charge. Here's a particle that does have a charge. We'll call that a proton. Proton, positively charged. Here's a particle that has a negative charge. That's an electron. Electrons have a negative charge. This whole big mass of protons and neutrons in the middle of our atom is called the nucleus. All right, so this whole part right here is called the nucleus, where the protons and neutrons are. In this first energy level around our atom, it can hold up to two electrons. And in this outer, the second energy level, it can hold up to eight electrons. For it to be stable, it can hold up to eight electrons for stability. So let's kind of review some of these atomic parts. No charge, neutron. Here's a part, positive charge, proton. Here's a part, negative charge, electron. All these protons and neutrons together make up the nucleus of the atom. This first energy level can only hold two electrons before it's full. The second energy level can hold up to eight electrons before it's full. So what makes an ion? And why are most atoms neutral? Why is it that most atoms don't even have a charge? Well, notice closely the protons in the nucleus. One, two, three positive charges. Notice the negatively charged electrons surrounding the nucleus. One, two, three negative charges. So three positives, Three negatives together make a neutral atom. So what's an ion then? An ion is just an atom that has a charge, either a positive charge or a negative one. So how could I get an ion? Well, one way I could get an ion is taking away an electron. If there's an electron taken away, I'll have one, two, three positives, and one, two negatives for a positively charged ion. What if I add an electron? So let's stick another electron up here. And I add an electron. Now I have one, two, three, four electrons. And one, two, three protons. It's going to be a negatively charged atom. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute. All you've done is either add an electron or take them one away. Why don't you add protons or take them away? It's a good question. That's because if I add a proton or take a proton away, I have a totally different atom. All right? The element will change. So let's take a closer look at those kind of things. So when we look at the periodic table and we see a symbol like this, C stands for carbon, above it we'll see this number 6. The 6 is the atomic number. In other words, that's the number of protons that that element has. That's right, so the number of protons. So if I have seven protons, if I add one, then it's nitrogen. Different atomic number, totally different element. Not the same. This number down here is the atomic mass, or how much does this atom weigh? So how do I figure out an atomic mass? 
Well, it's just a kind of simple math problem. Here's how it works. I take six protons plus the number of neutrons, and that equals the atomic mass. So six plus what equals 12? Well, you're like six. Six plus six equals 12. That means there's six neutrons in carbon. So carbon has six protons and six neutrons. And if it's a neutral atom, that means it has six electrons because six positives, six negatives to be a neutral atom. But you might be thinking now, I have six protons plus this number n neutrons equals the atomic mass or the weight of the atom for 12. You might be thinking, what about the electrons? Don't they weigh anything? Aren't they in there? Don't they count? Seems like it's a little unfair to count protons and neutrons and then just ignore the electrons. Well, think of it kind of like this. The electrons are so small that they don't add any appreciable weight to the atom. So let's say I had a scale big enough to weigh the whole world. So I'm weighing the whole world. I'm just as I'm about to set the world on the scale, an airplane takes off. Now, when that airplane takes off, is it going to change the weight of the whole world? Yeah, it will. Will it change it enough to be measured by the scale? Probably not. And that's where we're at here. The protons and neutrons are heavy enough to actually add mass to the atom. The electrons aren't heavy enough to add mass to the atom. What about oxygen? Oxygen has eight protons. So if it's a neutral atom, it means it's also going to have eight electrons. So if I have eight protons and the atomic weight is 16, eight plus how many neutrons equals 16? Well, eight plus eight equals 16. So there's eight neutrons there. Eight protons, eight neutrons, and if it's a neutral atom, eight electrons. Now that raises this question then, what's an isotope? You might have heard of like carbon-14 or carbon dating like that. Or uh, radioisotopes that are used like iodine that are used for medical imaging or maybe even the uranium isotopes that are used for nuclear bombs. So what makes an isotope an isotope? An isotope is simply the element with a different number of neutrons. Right? A different number of neutrons. Same number of protons, different number of neutrons. The protons can't change. So I've got protons, neutrons, and electrons in my atom. If I change the number of electrons, then I've got an ion. It's either going to be positively charged or negatively charged. If I change the number of neutrons, then I have a isotope. Same number of protons, different number of neutrons. Now you might be thinking, okay, uh, eight protons, eight neutrons, six protons, six neutrons, are all the elements the same? And the answer is no. Take a look here at hydrogen. Hydrogen has an atomic number of one. That means it has one proton. One proton plus what gives us an atomic mass of one? How many neutrons does hydrogen have? Well, one plus zero is one. So hydrogen does not have any neutrons whatsoever. But an isotope of hydrogen might have a neutron. 